this happen. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And I welcome you to the fourth Monday lecture of our summer term. And this time we have invited Mr. Bernd Berner from the Sheffield um, City Council. And he will be talking about the environment or experiences in environment, sustainable development, and climate change in the UK. So today we have a totally different context uh, compared to the MENA focus we had in the past lectures. But he will um, discuss his role, but also the whole dilemma, but also progress um, of different actors um, uh, in terms of NGOs, uh, municipalities, and the local government, national government, maybe as well. And um, maybe just a very brief um, profile on Bernd. He's German, from the region, right? Yeah. <laughs> Originally, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he has studied uh, environmental science. Uh, but since 2003, uh, you were working in the UK, in Sheffield? 1996. 1996 already? Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um, in Sheffield, exactly. So, and... Um, Bernd is focusing on uh, the aspects in, in the government or the local government uh, in terms of adaptation and climate change resilience and also mitigation. So all this is two major points within the resilience discussion. And I think I will say goes yours now. Thank you. And enjoy. So good afternoon and thanks thanks for turning up. And um, yeah, my name my name is Bernd. Bernd Furman. And um, I think I'll sort of talk you through my journey ending up in, ending up in the UK. Might be interesting to you in terms of finding future employment and how sort of coincidences and accidents can happen and you end up somewhere completely different where you didn't, where you didn't think you would, you would, um, you would end up. Um, just briefly, my background is in environment science, Umweltschutz, um, in Fachhochschule Bingen, um, sort of the early mid 90s. And um, if you probably don't don't remember at the time, um, does does the does the term Boden mean anything to you guys? Um, in the 90s, there was a move to um, <coughs> increase the um, number of women in technical technical jobs and um, so when we finished our degree um, that arrangement kicked in with the German government and uh, a, a lot of the guys like me didn't find a job and um, so yeah I was a graduate with no work experience and um, was looking for work and it was it was very difficult at the time um, most of our sort of environmental science people uh, moved to uh, local authorities or the public sector in, in Germany. And um, I struggled. I was a postman in Wiesbaden. And, uh, and I did some um, yeah, research at uh, Saarbrücken University as well. And just, a, just sort of a brief check. Um, are there any native English speakers here? Or is this all second? So usually second second language to you as well, is that right? And um, sort of cross-section from different, different countries as well. Um, let me just check. I wasn't, yeah, I found it, I found it difficult to find work, as I explained. Um, but I visited a, a small community in the north of, the north of Scotland. This is a bit blurred, but it's up here. Um, fin Finton Foundation. And um, during my degree in Germany, I actually visited the Finton Foundation for workshops and conferences on, on the environment. Has anybody heard of the Finton community and the Finton Foundation in northern Scotland? International community. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was. I didn't know much about it, and um, but a, a friend of mine recommended. You know, there's an eco eco village conference. It might be interesting to what I studied uh, in Germany, and I, I went to a few workshops and conferences there. Um, 
coming back to Germany and still finding it hard to find to find paid work, um, they actually offered me a job to run their um, ecological wastewater treatment facility called um, Living Living Machine, which was based on on sort of the rebid rebid concept, um, but in a more industrial um, sort of setting. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Just um, briefly come back to the Fintron Foundation. So it's a member uh, of the Eco Village of the Global Eco Village Network. Um, as you can see, you know, when we talk when we talk about the UK, you know, London, London here on this on this sort of level. Um, Edinburgh up here, but then you go even further north. So this is actually on the level of the south southern Norway. So it's um, if you look at the differences between here, so the climate is is, is very different to the what we sort of usually think about England. So northern Scotland is a is a long way away. Um, the community itself started in the early 1960s, so it has been well established, and um, it had it had a real it had a the local community, the Scottish rural community, it had it had a bit of a reputation as a as a hippie community, of course, and a cult community, and all that, which which it wasn't, um, but it it took a it took a fair fair few years for the community to establish itself and to be recognised. 50 years later, so I was there at the 50th anniversary a few years ago, um, the Fintan Foundation has spread across the whole of the region and um, it, in its influence and, and, and respect as well. Um, there are there's about 400, 400 resident members living, living in the community here. It's very close, as you can see, it's very close to the sea. So here, it's straight, straight along here. The Fintorn Bay, which is this little tiny inlet here, has a microclimate, which might be quite interesting to you as well in terms of development. <coughs> so um, even the highlands and ice and snow are very, very close here. It, hard, it, in terms of frost and, and, and cold, um, this microclimate here is actually very mild. And uh, there are a lot of dolphins and seals in this area and this bay all the time. Um, the, work, the workshops and, 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 um, and presentations and courses are about 3,000 um, resident visitors a year come to the foundation. It's a multinational and a multi-religious uh, community, um, sort of applying spiritual principles, but it doesn't matter what religion you're part of uh, in daily life. And um, for most people, English is a second language there. So it was quite easy for me, with my school English from Germany, having not practiced it for years, to end up in, in northern Scotland, where everybody else was just trying to get along with English as a second language. Um, in terms of eco-village, the, the first mention in architectural literature were actually the whiskey barrel whiskey bat houses here. So these are actually real bat barrels where they where the, the whiskey is usually being produced in the distilleries. And after a few years this is oak, really good quality oak. And after a few years they are exhausted, they gave they're given all their flavour into the whiskey and they they waste product. And um, so one clever chap Roger, Roger Dudna from the community had the idea. He got the he got the material for free, and he built his own first round house um, with a whiskey whiskey that barrel house. And these are actually, if you Google it, they are in architectural design uh, books, etc., etc. So this was the first start of the community being known for its unusual design and and development which was in the in sort of the early 80s. Um, <clears throat> the community, there was a resident architect, uh, um, John Talbot, an Australian, who moved to the community and he developed uh, something he called the breathing, the breathing walls, which um, 
a timber frame structure with a membrane, and he actually used, which was not known in the UK at the time, I think it's a German, at the time it was a German product called ISO, Isoflop, which is recycled newspaper, uh, as insulation in the walls. So having triple glazing windows from Denmark and insulation from Germany, this was in the 80s really ahead of its time in terms of the rest of the UK, which I can vouch for because I'm, I live now in Sheffield here. And um, the design still applied to, to construction is somehow sometimes inferior to what has been done in the 80s in, F in Finton, the Finton Foundation already. Um, it has been recognized as the community with the lowest in the Western world, with the lowest ecological footprint as a community. So uh, global, in terms of global hectares, 2.71. And um, a lot has to do with, it, with, with its um, home and energy supply in the buildings and also with food, food generation. 50% of the food for the community, 500 plus people plus thousands of uh, visitors a year, are actually grown here organically and biodynamically in, in, in the region. Again, you would think Northern Scotland not very great for agriculture, but because of the microclimate, it's all possible there. These are just some examples um, of yeah, what I encountered in the, in the foundation. The first wind turbine, they got second hand from Denmark in the 80s. Um, it paid back within a few years time. And then in, in the 90s they got some more wind turbines. Um, I think they're up to, I think they're five now. And again, if I, if I think about the discussions we have at the moment in the UK in general about wind farms and wind turbines and not on my doorstep, not in my backyard, the lobby, lobbying against wind turbines in the UK is significant. Um, people just don't want them. So maybe offshore, but you know, in the national parks or in the green belt of cities, a lot of people don't want them and there's a huge resentment against them. Um, discussion, of course, where does, where does the future energy comes from? Um, yeah, so huge debate in the UK at the moment. Um, this is just um, one other example of, of the buildings they put up there. So there, there is uh, photovoltaic, solar, solar thermal, um, a lot of passive, passive design uh, in terms of gaining all the warmth and heat and light during the day you can get. Um, one reason why I moved on eventually after three years, I really struggled with the long winters, very dark up there. Um, in, summer it hardly, it, in summer it hardly gets dark, um, if at all, but in winter you know, it's dark at three o'clock in the afternoon and doesn't get light until ten o'clock in the morning. So if you struggle with light deficiency um, like I do in long winters, after three years I just um, had to move on. This, one, this was part of my work here. This is the indoor reed bed. It's a highly concentrated uh, it's a living machine system. It's, it's sort of a, on a small footprint. If you don't have the luxury of square meters and square meters of building a reed bed system, you can actually build the same principle that works on, on microbial activity in, in a series of tanks which are aerated. Which are aerated. So you sort of enhance the biology that, that happened on the roots of the plants in, in order to treat the wastewater. And this, this facility was treating 55 cubic meters a day of residential wastewater in, for, um, from the community. Very successful. And um, it was clean enough to be discharged into the, uh, into the bay area I showed you earlier. Um, ecological buildings, um, experimental. They experiment with community and society structures up there. Um, they experiment with ecological buildings. So it's everything from, I think it's for eight or ten community members. They build a fairly large straw bale house um, where community members live. And um, they build, you're probably familiar with the 
Earth Earth Ship Principle. He cycled recycled tires around Earth as a thermal mass. Are you are you familiar with Earth ships? So they built they built the building up there as well. Um, which yeah, I think it was a trial and um, but the consensus was it's too much hard work and um, they're not quite sure if they would build another one, but they've done it. Green roof and everything, built into the mound. Uh, I mentioned the timber frame breathing wall structures, um, water treatment, water recycling, energy generation, the food, food again, um, the Earthshare organic farm is supplying 50% uh, of the food and in additionally to 300 local households in the region as well. Trees for Life you may have heard of, founded. Um, in the Clinton Foundation. It's a charity uh, which is reinstating the Caledonian rainforest in Scotland. So they're actually taking non-native species out if they're invasive and they're rebuilding the original Scottish yeah, forest and um, very successful international organization now. And um, the Finna Foundation has been recognized as a uh, UN Center for Human Settlements. It's um, part of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. So there are um, American students uh, spending at least half a year um, in, in Scotland as part of their, as their degree from the, from the US in terms, in terms of uh, community creation and community living. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, don't save your questions until the end. If you have questions now, if you want clarification, just interrupt me and ask me. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask for the water. It's mostly the water, the grey water from the taps and the kitchens, right? It's not, it's right. not clean black water. It is. It's grey it's, it's and black water. Both. Everything goes to everything goes the living machine. I also want to ask you another question, like in those kind of communities, sometimes they find that it's hard to keep up the motivation of the people. So what if some of the people don't feel like collaborating and they're just living there? They were living there, like, do they have to be forced into all these new experimental living experiments? No, this, it's a democratic process. So it's a, it's a real living, organic community. and. Um, all those suggestions of building an earth ship, getting a new wind turbine, you know, being responsible for your own water treatment, that will, will have gone through a very lengthy discussion with the community, with the core community. It's quite a complex, complex structure how, the, how the, the foundation works and the community which is in the core. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a real exciting and, and experimental place in, in building democracy and community and, and arrive at consensus. So there will be a lot of presentations, there will be a lot of trying, people trying to convince their friends and colleagues to adopt something and it may be thrown out, it may not happen. Um, but it's a, it's a real interesting um, microcosmos. So it's, it's, I know it's far away in the north of Scotland, but whatever happens, globally, more or less happens there under the microscope, it's a pressure cooker. So they have all sorts of problems. Um, but, you know, if you talk about austerity and financial problems, governments or banking crises, they have to deal with the same issues on a, you know, on a, under, under a microscope. So it's quite a, it's quite a fritious community, but successful you know, since the early 60s, it has been it grew from the early 60s into this well-respected international community. Um, uh, what's, what's the German one? There is one near Berlin. And they have exchanges with the Global Eco Village Network. They exchange. They go. They go to Oro, Oroville. They go to. They invite people over. They host conferences. They host international conferences every year to learn from each other and to share their experience. Um, it's quite a, it's not, it's not, you 
No, it's not all um, um, airy fairy up there. It's very down to earth. They develop their own um, currency. They have their own trading system. They created the Earthshare organic box scheme, biodynamic box scheme, on the base on the principle of Rudolf Steiner's biodynamic um, agriculture. They started the first Steiner Waldorf school up there in the whole of the region. And now the whole region sends their kids there. So initially it was the foundation that they created this. Of course, a German bakery popped up as everywhere. So um, they make fantastic, fantastic bread. And then a French, a French uh, pastisserie maker turned up and in, in the nearby town runs a fantastic get the best French croissants on the whole of Scotland, I would say. Yeah. So it's a real inspiring and creative place with a lot of friction and problems to get there. So it's real. It's a real struggling, growing and a real good community. So and always <coughs> always trying to push the boundaries, always trying to to try some something else. But it's it's a, on a democratic basis. When you say eco village, it's uh, officially a, it's an official network of many eco villages around the world. Yeah, Gen Global Eco Village Network. Gen is um. Uh, it's Gen. Yeah, is part is part of the foundation is part of, of the Global Eco Village Network. Yeah. That's a that's an official body or organization dealing yeah. dealing with <coughs> Um, I have a question towards the food supply of the village because you mentioned that it's 50% they are self-growing self yeah. yeah. and how are they managing it? Like, are there, is there a farm attached to the compound? Yeah, yeah. there's a huge, um, these are the dune, dune lands, but there's a huge garden here and they, they acquired more and more farmland in the local area. I can't remember how many how many acres or hectares there are, but um, it's quite substantial how many acres of farmland they have now to produce to produce their own food. It says here 65 acres. But yes, the whole they they. Again, it started very small. It was a Swiss, a Swiss guy who had the idea of creating this organic box, like a vegetable box scheme, just for a few people. And it was successful and has, taken, has been taken up, and then they acquired more and more farmland to produce more and more food. So, vegetable, vegetables is 50%. They supply their own vegetables, uh, fruit, salad, vegetables, 50% um, of, of the community. And that is for 400 plus members who live there. Plus, I mean, at times there are, I would, I would think, up to 400. And there's a conference on. There's four, five hundred people from all over the world. So everyone is participating of the community, or they, do they have special groups for farming? If you, that's, that's quite complex. But if you become a real, if you become a member of the community. You have to you, you go through a um, sort of um, a learn a, an introduction. You have experience week, and um, to see whether it's for you or it's not for you. Lots of people come for one week and then never never come back again. It's not for me. Um, other people are then curious and interested, and they do um, uh, living in the community project, which is four weeks. And um, so you you move you move up in, into this. Three months. I think there's sort of a, a workshop that goes over three months where you where you learn whether the system, whether you like it, whether it's not for you, and whether you want to stay. And then you can become, become a member. And then there are work departments. You're either in garden, home care, maintenance. Um, they got their own transport transport system. You can maintain the, the buses, etc. Um, so there are working groups. And then there is the educational part. Um, they have they have education education department which is which is giving workshops at Price Waterhouse Coopers. So they travel the world now to actually facilitate 
um, non-violent communication, conflict resolution, team building, um, management change in big organizations. They, work, they, they teach and work for banks, insurance companies, um, they advise governments. So it's a whole different, a different groups of specialism in the community. And then there's the wider community. So you become, you can, you can be a, an, an, an associate really. And you can live in the Finton village, which is the old Finton village out there, or in, in the nearby villages and towns, and you're sort of affiliated with, with the foundation, but you're not you're not a full-time member. If you're a full-time member, you can you, you can retire there. You've been looked after um, for the rest of your life if you want. Um, other people from the outside sell their flat in London and build an eco home here, eco house here in the in this in this development, we've got these. So they've just started a new housing development out here, a bit, a bit to the left here where they're, they're still living. And so there's a huge demand, a huge demand for people who want to live there and, and work there. It started off with a campsite, that's where it all started in 62, but that's a that's a big book about that. I can't go into the details how that happened right now. But yeah. Can you tell us the name of the book? Uh, the, ma um, the Magic of Fintor. Magic of Fintor. Fintor. That's how you pronounce it. It became famous in, in the um, I think early 70s because of its garden. There were some BBC, BBC documentaries about their um, ability to grow vegetables up there. There were some interesting, there were some interesting research and documentaries about how did they manage to grow stuff there when nobody else could. So. As I said, I did move on. Eventually, after three years, but I'm going back. I'm, I'm, I'm a regular visitor up there, and because of my experience with um, the living machine, uh, the principle has been exported to the Earth Center, which is um, near Sheffield, so in the, the middle of. If you, look, if you look here, so we are now about here, and the. The Earth Center, um, you probably haven't heard of the Millennium, Millennium Projects in the UK. The government uh, around the year 2000 invested a lot of um, um, government funding and lottery, lottery funding into developing national, national centers of. There will be a national center for gardening, there will be a national center for mining, a national center for film and media industry. And then there was the big plan to have um, to establish a, a world center for sustainable development, promoting the best environmental and sustainable practice. And it was all dreamed up by the former UK, uh, the former director of Greenpeace UK, Jonathan Smales. He had this grand vision to to build or to buy on on a site which was former colliery, so it's a mining, mining area. The, the whole of that north of England area is um, former coal and steel industry. So all the villages and all the, all the towns were based on and relied on coal mining. And in Sheffield, where I'm, where I'm now, stainless steel was invented. And um, so all the coal from the surrounding countryside went to Sheffield to produce steel which is still dust to, to, to this day. But this is the heritage. Um, Maggie, Margaret Thatcher, you may know, she, um, she caused havoc in the 80s. She closed them all down. Huge minor strikes, huge cultural up, upheaval. And um, it, left, it left the whole region devastated. There was no work. There were all the coal miners, former steel and coal industry, there was no work nothing. It was a deprived area. It became, it was listed as uh, one of the most deprived, South Yorkshire was 
one of the most deprived areas in the whole of Europe, and then was able to get Objective 1 European funding until a few years ago. This region was one of the most deprived areas in the whole, whole of the EU. But in this con context, in the contrast, so there was resentment that this had to stop because um, the government decided, not because there was no coal, and actually now we are thinking about reopening some of them, um, um, just because the government decided it's not viable, it's cheaper to import coal, cheaper or better to build nuclear power stations, etc. But this was, this was the side. So there was this dream of building this sustain, the center for sustainable development center, demonstration center, national center for the whole of the UK on this on this landscape, which is which was a bit like a moon a moon landscape, lots of coal spoil. But it was the idea to build to build all this um, on yeah 1.6 1.6 square kilometers. Um, with a lot of funding, and it opened it in 2000. I was responsible for this building here, which is the living machine, like um, a smaller version in the Fintron Foundation. This was the larger brother of the living machine at the Earth Centre, and I was, I was responsible to make it work for the whole of the site, which, which was planned to receive 2,000, 3,000 visitors a day um, during, during peak time. For me, I have to say, pers personal, personal move from uh, international community in Northern Scotland to uh, former coal mining village in South Yorkshire, it was a cultural shock for me as much as it was for them to have something that like this being developed on their doorstep. Um, but I found it, I, it was interesting, it was a very different background, it was Fintan Foundation, multinational, international community, this was just white working class in Northern England, and um, you know, even, even as a German you were definitely a foreigner, and um, it didn't matter I think even if you were from Sheffield, 20 miles down the road, you were, you were a stranger. So it was a very different environment, very different culture. But at the same time, because they were a mining community, it was all about being colleagues. It was all about being, helping each other. So once you were there, and they, know, they knew you, it was sort of, you were sort of adopted. Really. So um, it was, in the end, it was actually a very good experience to be working with um, people who lost their jobs, had to retrain. They were all coal miners there. It didn't matter whether they were the, the cook, the gardener, the security guard, the active, the canoe, the canoe activity guide. They were all ex-coal miners trying to make another living, trying to retrain something, something else. Um, but it was it was resentment. The government, uh, the, a lot of people, a lot of local people have said. Why couldn't we use this money to keep the mines open for another 10 years? But it was gone, the mines were closed and shut, so there was no way of, the money wasn't there for coal mining, the money was only there to create a centre like this. Um, unfortunately, I have to say, the Centre for Sustainable Development was not sustainable. It, the business case, which was put together by a reputable organisation in London, um, was just not working. The visitor numbers were very low, the income was very low, the funding was only there once for capital. It was just capital development, no revenue funding. So from day one, when this visitor centre opened, you were expected to make a profit. Sort of common sense. Most businesses need a year or two or three years to carry them over into making profit. Um, eventually, the government did change the business case and allowed those millennium millennium projects to have two-year revenue funding before they were cut off that funding stream. 
but that was too late for the Earth Center. The Earth Center was closed by then already. And um, I mean, I, I would I would say it was it was in the wrong place. Probably in London, it would have south of England, it would have survived. It would have thrived probably. <coughs> uh, it was in the wrong place. It was the wrong business model initially, and um, it was ahead of its time. This was the largest solar PV canopy, flat structure, flat roof in the whole of Europe at the time. So now we talk about the you know farms, <coughs> solar farms everywhere. But this at the time in 2000, this was this was unique. The structure in itself was architectural feat. Really, it was it was quite an ambitious vision. A lot of the buildings were were designed by famous architects. Um, Bill Bill Dunster did the conference centre. Again, again, unique features I'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, Field and Clegg built this structure into into the earth. No heating, no cooling or mechanical cooling. It was all. I mean, you guys probably can tell me more about this. These are um, ventilation, un under floor ventilation principles like the Romans used. So you probably are more familiar with passive ventilation uh, than I am. But this was built into the mound, so it was a lot of thermal mass in concrete. Not very, not very sustainable. Um, once it's there, it was heating up during the summer, giving off heat during the winter, and it had a very stable climate for a ginormous exhibition in here. Um, this is the living machine, the big, the big structure here. Um, again, trialing and testing new materials at the time. This is a Teflon, a Teflon pet base, a triple, triple layer material, um, which was developed in Germany, I believe. And, um, and again, Bill Dunsters, who has developed Beddington, Beddington Z, Zero in London, a housing estate. Um, it's all recycled material. It's a Gaben, Gaben walls, a green roof, um, solar thermal, solar PV, um, a vertical wind turbine, passive passive ventilation on top of the roof, and a, and a hot cup, swimming pool really. Um, a huge tank in the basement, which was heated up during the summer with the solar thermal, and uh, the hot water was stored there for winter, and then released in a in a radiator system within within the building. This is also a biomass boiler in here, so the flue is actually is also driving the wind turbine as well as the wind. So there was a lot of experimental um, technology and principles used. Um, Water treatment I've mentioned, we have bioswells and urban, sustainable urban drainage principles there. Um, biomass was actually grown there as much as burned there. And um, but as I said it wasn't sustainable. So in two in two thousand and three I was made redundant and by the end of two thousand and three the place was shot was shut and was closed down and um, featured in a few TV series as a derelict sort of, sort of um, seen, seen in, in, a, in a few um, TV series and was used by the police to storm buildings, to train to storm buildings, etc. In 2012 we had another lease of life, um, Kingswood Education, International Education organization bought the place and reopened it. It's now again a very active um, outdoor pursuit, outdoor experience for school children. So when, when children go on excursions and, and um, activities outside the school, the schools come here for canoeing, there's climbing walls, archery, zip wire, you name it, it's, it's all there. But it's a shame it was um, yeah, it was very ambitious, but it was just not ready. No, 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 it was 
So it was, um, I think it was a, yeah, a real shame that it wasn't successful. There were plans for phase two, which would have been even more entrepreneurial and in terms of uh, practicing or experimenting with technology. So I did end up eventually at Sheffield City Council, where I'm still. I started off as an air quality. That's one question regarding the water, because you said there's a huge water tank. Yeah. So, but the water um, heat storage capacity is not that good that you can store the whole winter, or was it really a, like a thermal yeah. it was under, pain around it? It was, un, it was underground and was heavily insulated. And was it like afterwards repeated? Because I never heard it before. Is it a system which really works? Or I, I don't what know. Is the <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it worked that well. I think it was Bill Dunster's experiment for. I'm not sure if they tried it anywhere else, but I think the the idea the idea was great. But I think they had problems with the because they used radiators. And radiators, you need to. As far as I know, you need to have hot temperature. If you've got um, underfloor heating, you can have lower temperatures. To the but they used radiators, and I think that was not working well. It, I, I think it may well work if you, if you have a, a low temperature system like underfloor heating. But they did have problems eventually with... That's, I think that's the reason that the biomass boiler was used more often. But um, I think that the, store, the storing of the heat was working. The, the heating up of the tank was working. I think the, on the other side, the heating system on the other end was not compatible with it. But I have not heard about this since either. I'm not sure. I'm not recommending it, just saying that's what they do. <coughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I started off as an air quality action officer. There was a need to look into. Um, oh, I start with Sheffield. I start with Sheffield. A population of five hundred and sixty thousand. So it's a decent, decent sized, decent sized city in, in in the UK. It is one of the eight core cities. So it's one of the. Biggest, eight biggest cities outside London, which is a small group, it's a gang. We gang on, we go gang on up on London. So um, we form our own little club, uh, the core cities, to um, have a voice to make to make sure the government is actually listening to uh, what's going on elsewhere, not just in London. Um, again, it's what I would say uh, Yorkshire. Yorkshire folk, so it's it's working class, it's working class history, and and, and attitude. Um, so all the coal came to Sheffield, and I said, steel, stainless steel was invented there. Um, more or less, all the cutlery in the UK came came from Sheffield, like Soling and I think the stainless in Germany. <coughs> It was heavy, heavily bombarded in World War II by the Germans because of all the industry, the steel industry. Um, but they missed. They missed a lot of it apparently through um, sophisticated radar detraction system they employed in Sheffield. Um, again, after Maggie closed down the coal, the coal mine, there was a decline in the 1980s and the 1990s. And a lot of EU funding was um, uh, channeled into into Sheffield, into South Yorkshire. You've got two football clubs, if anybody's interested in football. Um, and it's it's bordering the Peak National Park. So it's one of the greenest cities in Europe, just because it has thousands and thousands of trees and is actually part of a national park, which is, which is an advantage. Yeah, coming back to my different roles, Air Quality Action Officer. Um, there is a huge um, 
inequality gap in Sheffield. We have some of the poorest areas in the country on the east, north, northeast side, and we have some of the richest neighbourhoods in the country. Um, the Deputy, Deputy Prime Minister lives here in the, in the southwest. And so this is, there's a bus route going from over here through to here. And one bus route, number 83, and there is a 10 year life expectancy difference. Um, so in terms of inequalities and um, deprivation in, in, in Sheffield, it's quite a stark, a stark difference. One of the reasons is the poor air quality in this site. So it's like here in, the, in Germany, the, the, the wind mostly coming from the west is blowing all the pollution downstream, really, downwind. And again, there is still a lot of industrial heritage and pollution down here. And then you've got the social, uh, the social economical factors as well. By the way, this is the part of the national park, so the big part of the city boundary is green. It's just a huge part. So my, my role was to help in developing the Air Quality Action Plan to, um, to look at inequalities and deprivation and to help establish um, monitoring stations within Sheffield to actually monitor what, we, what air quality we have and how, how it's improving or declining. Um, I was involved in low emission transport projects in terms of retrofitting buses, promoting clean technology in terms of transport and vehicle movement, and a lot of community engagement as well, working working with those with those neighborhoods here to decide what needs what needs doing. And also again in terms of cultural cultural issues. There is a huge ethnic minority population here, from Somalia to Pakistan, India, a lot of sort of former British colonies, um, a lot of people live over on this side and not here. So this is, in terms of fairness and equality, it's quite interesting how Sheffield is structured. <coughs> so that was my first role. Um, then I moved to a different department in terms of environmental strategy and um, we currently carried on on, the, on those themes so we developed more transport, um, renewable transport, uh, low carbon transport, renewable energy projects with local community groups and, and the bus operators as well. Um, Sheffield was then developing, I think it was the first green roof policy so every new development was automatically asked to have a green roof and you needed to argue the case why you shouldn't have one or why you couldn't have one. So that was sort of turning the, turning this around. The, 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 our, my planning colleague, colleagues made, made this a given. You want to build a school, you want to build an office building, you want to do X, Y, Z, you have a green roof. If, why, if you can't do it, you have to explain why. Um, this has changed, unfortunately, um, because of austerity measures and a change in government. Um, developers has, have been told that we might we make it now as easy as easy as possible for you to develop anything you want in any any quality you want. It's really going backwards in in, in, in the UK, backwards a long way in terms of what we try to do what we have achieved in the early sort of 2000s and um, since the election, so since 2010, we have been yeah, experiencing a lot of problems when it comes to city development, individual development, building control um, because of, of changes in, in planning policy and, and the powers the local authorities have to implement like this. The government is taking little by little, step by step, all the powers away from local authorities and make it as easy as possible for developers to do what they like. But there's still the 
Green Roof Centre at the University of Sheffield, which is um, a national centre for green roofs. The professor running it is world renowned Professor Nitra Dunnett. He did the whole of the Olympic Park for London in 2012. Um, he develops cities in China in terms of sustainability and uh, the green the green aspects. So there's a real a real centre. Center is really for the industry. A lot of German companies who develop green roofs in Switzerland and Germany, they are using the green roof center as a as sort of a, uh, a diving board into the UK. So they are working with the green roof center to get onto onto the um, building building and construction market to promote their products to build green roofs off the shelf. The, my next job, current job, a sustainable development officer. And um, that was still under the old government that climate change and vulnerability, cities' vulnerability to extreme weather and climate change has been sort of acknowledged. And that we are, as a, as a system, an urban system, are extremely vulnerable to, yeah, initially extreme weather or longer term climate change. So, local authorities were forced to report under the um, National Indicator Project, we were forced to report in our adaptation work. So first we had to establish how vulnerable are we, what is vulnerable, and what are we planning to do to become more resilient and adapt to those extreme weather and climate change threats. So that was my role, was reporting back to government every year um, how our um, local climate impact impacts profile looks like. So we have to do some research on what happened over the last 10 years in terms of extreme weather and what are we projecting to happen in the next few decades. So I had to report back to government every year until the new government came in and they strapped it all. So um, I'll go on explain this in a, a bit more. So I think we were going down the right direction in terms of making sure that our our city and our cities are prepared for changes in climate and extreme weather. We. Um, yeah, we were we were flooded in 2007. The River Don goes through the city, something like this here. And the city was cut in half. So I had people people staying overnight with us when they couldn't get from work to home because the trunk, everything broke down. There was no tram, there was no train, no cars, everything was cut in half and everything was flooded. And this sort of was the, the wake up call in 2007 for the council, for the, for the country, but also for, for Sheffield City Council to say, okay, we are vulnerable. So this one in a hundred year flood event happened now, and it almost happened in 2012 again, one in a, a one in a hundred year flood event. So um, we were forced to think, what do we need to do? Where, where are our vulnerable areas? And what are we, we vulnerable to? And um, so we um, did this, what they call local climate impact profile, to assess what happened over the last 10 years. What sort of extreme weather events did we experience and what did they lead to? I will, I've got, I got a more specific climate change short presentation at the end, which I can which I can show you if you have got time. Um, but yeah, this is just to highlight what we had to what we had to um, develop in terms of vulnerability and shelter. The reason why a lot of things have stopped, and this is sort of my just sort of reality check and personal experience is um, there is no money left in the kitty. 
So since the new government, the coalition of Lib Dems and, and um, the Conservatives, local authorities have experienced a huge amount of cuts. If you look, if you look at the overall central budget for the country and where money is being spent, so only 7% originally was spent on local authorities of, of central, central government funding. But we had, to, we had the burden of 22%, which is actually more in the north. So some cities, some local authorities further south have much less than that. We have to burden much more. So all the core cities, which are I think pretty much all labor, Labour government um, are being hit very hard by by those funding cuts. So, in terms of Sheffield, we have experienced since 2010 a 50% of funding cuts from the, from the central government. So we have 50% less money to deal with, and only. Um, the net revenue budget that we can control, so because some of it is statutory requirements like social health care and education, we have no choice, we have to spend the money on that. So we only got you know, 30, 31% reduction in what we can actually do, do with that money. This is sort of explained this a bit better. So these, this is the budget we have to use the money, the money for, and these are statutory. We have no choice. We have to spend on social care, education, housing benefits, housing revenue, and and, on, and all that. And one issue is with with the demographics changing. We actually have we have to spend more money on social care in the future because we we've got a growing elderly population. Um, we have more young children, so more money will be spent on education. This leaves only little money, or for less money, for everything else, including the environment. So this is this is what we have to play with for more of this money, and it's getting less. So we're, we're just yeah, we're just losing losing all our revenues and. Until two years ago, I was working for a director of sustainable development. We had a directorate of about 10 people. Um, there are two officers left now, so no director anymore, no manager, really. Just a line, man line management, somebody who doesn't know what, what sustainable development is about. He's housing, he's a director of housing. Um, so sustainable development, environmental impacts, climate change, just doesn't know. He's got his hands full to deal with housing. Um, so there are two officers left dealing, for example, with environment, whether that's low carbon technology, whether that's climate change. So that, that's reality. And um, that also limits what, what we can influence. So when it comes to planning applications, when IKEA, for example, wants to build in Sheffield, and um, they want to build in an area which is extremely congested with traffic already. And it has a very, very poor air quality. So the sort of local community is suffering already from all the health impacts of, of transport. And IKEA wants to build there. And we know what that means. People drive there. That's the business, business concept. They drive there with their car. And they have been turned away twice. And now with the, with the austerity measures and the, the, and the city running out of money, last week our councillors have agreed for IKEA to build against all the health impact advice from officers, against all the transport bottleneck congestion issues they have been told about. Um, it's just because there's tax, there's money coming in, there's business, job creation. So it's it's really the yeah, idea. In Britain, we have this in this dilemma. Everything is about economy. Everything is going backwards in terms of um, creating jobs, getting money into the city, and all the other all the other impacts or aspects are being yeah, neglected. I would say. 
I'm not sure how long how long it will how, how long it can go on like this, but um, we'll, we'll see. This is just a short explanation about the demographics. So that's that's where we are now. We'll have many more elderly people, which will need more health care. We have a lot of younger people that need education. So all the all the spending is being changed as well. And this is the yeah, just the gap, the gap widening financially is, this is projected. And the government has said, you know, they are, they are, they are not finished yet with cutting, cutting budgets. This is continuing. If the government is being re-elected next year, next year elections, um, they have planned at least another two years until um, this business year 2017-2018. And what then is left of local government, local authority, um, we, we, we don't know. Is there time for the climate change slides, or should I stop? We still have 20 minutes. Yeah. Do you have any discussion, or just a video of your presentation? Would you, you <coughs> have more questions on this one, or you would like to have it on the climate change subject? How do we get back into here? Because this is blank. unless you have you know, specific questions about climate change. Um, this is for our region, this is for Yorkshire and, Yorkshire and Humber. That's what we, what we experience, have experienced already. Um, extreme rainfall and flooding with all the risk to drainage, transport, infrastructure, the usual. But we also have experienced drought. Um, they are British are obsessed with, with, with their loans, with water and their loans, you know that. <laughs> so we have um, hose pipe bans. You are not allowed, allowed to use your hose pipe to water your lawn. It's official, this is government. I'm not kidding. And um, of course temperatures, temperature risk and, and the big unknown which has actually killed two people in Leeds, another big city in the north of is the wind speed. So all this sort of, we have sort of a handle on these, this, we think we know what the projections are, but the extreme wind speeds, and like I think Cologne and Düsseldorf has experienced a few weeks ago, six people died, 5,000 trees uprooted in Düsseldorf alone. Um, this is the big unknown, the big danger, we don't know what, what will happen to our infrastructure in Sheffield. <clears throat> but um, as you can see, we are, already, we are already in the 2020s in terms of climate change projections, um, but in terms of mean summer temperatures, uh, summer rainfall decreasing, which has already resulted, the first time ever um, we have experienced um, shrinkage of soil in Sheffield so much that buildings have been damaged. That never happened before in Sheffield. England, it drizzles all the time, rains a lot, so it drizzles, so everything's always moist-ish, but um, over the last few years, in 2012, uh, Sheffield buildings have suffered because of subsidence. The first time it has been recorded that the soil has been so dry that it has created settlement, settlement in buildings and of course structural damage. That's, and that, that's projected to happen more often. Um, we had 10 years of very mild winters, they sold all their snow plows, they stopped ordering the salt, and then we had two of the most severe winters with half a meter snow. Easter last year we had a half a meter snow in Sheffield. And of course nobody is prepared for that. Everything collapses. In 2012 we had the driest winter on record, just to be followed by the wettest summer on record. And this is where Sheffield almost got flooded again. I mean, we had smaller floods, that was in 2012. 
by the time we got our head around that it, it got to drown, it was already too late, and so um, we had the better summer. But this is this is where Sheffield's drinking water comes from. This is a reservoir in the Peak District National Park, and um, yeah, you can see for yourself what happened there. So we were running out. Short, we had a shortage in, in terms of drinking water for a 560,000 people city. So this happens in the UK. Um, this is just a brief. You know, you guys probably have studied this in detail. What is happening across Europe? potentially uh, under certain scenarios of climate change by the end of the century um, where we, you know, Britain pretty much gets away with a lot of it because it is still quite damp. But if you, if you look at, at summer extremes even in the UK or in Germany over here, so this is something. Are you guys building this in to your design? Looking at those issues, I've seen I've seen down downstairs an exhibition. There was um, one development looked at floodplains and what buildings are and how they have to be positioned. So I see we're doing, we're doing all this. Um, this is still the this is still the legacy of the old government, which we are still which we are still applying, because this government hasn't actually changed the law as such, just taken certain measures away. So these are the issues we are looking at, these 11 sectors, which then have sort of been translated into themes. And this is what we as local authority have to look at in, if, we, if we develop a city. Um, it's all based on the 2008 Climate Change Act. In 2012, we had the first climate change risk assessment, which is repeated every five years, and the National Adaptation Plan. Um, this is what I'm looking at at the moment with colleagues in Sheffield. We are looking at how our system in Sheffield is coping with future climate change. How, how, do, we, how, how do we secure our fuel? How do we get our food supplied to Sheffield? That what happened in 2007 when Sheffield was flooded within hours the supermarkets were empty and the lorries couldn't get back into and they were, they were parked outside the city on the motorway the lorries parked with food and they couldn't get into the city to supply the people because everything was flooded so transport system how do you get the food even if it's on your doorstep to the vulnerable people who need it so this is all sort of have you got a plan b in place if something if there's an extreme event um, yeah. Can you explain a bit what you then after we did, and what was your reaction? Um, we are, yeah, we developed um, a flood and water management strategy, flood and water management strategy in Sheffield. So we were working with the environment agency who are the responsible body for flood management. Um, a lot of initial work was done along the River Don, which is the main river, because the maintenance of the river was neglected over the last 10 years. So there were a lot of trees growing in the river, slowing down the water speed. A lot of small sort of river islands formed naturally, which became nature reserves by default and they had to be taken away they had to be they had to be demolished um, trees had to be cut just to guarantee that the water is flowing faster fast enough um, we developed um, flood walls and flood defense measures in certain areas which is still ongoing to huge financial costs some of the heavy industry, steel industry, um, they, they said if it happens again, they have to leave Sheffield. They can't insure themselves anymore. So they got one insurance case through from 2007. If it happens again, they are either bankrupt or will move, move away from Sheffield because they have to move outside the floodplain. 
and a lot of the industry, because it was all it was all built on water mills, so they had to be near the rivers, is traditionally still along the river, and now they're being flooded. So it's all it's all that the main the main waste was. Is there also another floodplain or something else? Because like if you only and um, put more walls that it's faster than the problem is appearing somewhere else. Yeah, now we have we have that problem. We have um, neighbors. We have uh, towns along downstream, and um, yeah, the development is the negotiations and development is happening together. So there are different schemes along the river, and they are talking now about opening up certain areas they can be flooded in. Um, there's also work going on to encourage and build many more sustainable urban drainage systems to be much more responsible with the, with the rainwater downpour on the roofs, to have it trickling into the ground where it happens. So flash flooding is avoided. Um, but a lot of the drainage system is from the Victorians. It's it's a hundred and 150 years old, some of it, and um, it's a huge task for for and, and cost to rebuild something the Victorians did. You Nowadays, I think I think the Netherlands are quite an example of how to do things sort of modern and, and, and visionary. Um, England has to cope with a lot of historic infrastructure and structures that need to be adapted now to future climate. This was one, one big project I was coordinating with a consultancy called Arab. They wanted to develop a tool. Um, so we were the guinea pigs, we were the trial in Sheffield. And they used the 15, these 15 systems or spokes on the wheel um, and saying, okay, we've got, a, we've got an urban an urban system and everything depends on each other. Like I said, if there's a road flooded, the food supply is affected. If, if um, communication breaks down in the traffic management center, which it did because it was flooded, um, emergency services, ambulances couldn't get through to certain areas because they have problems communicating. So it's, it's this sort of, okay, we're all dependent. This is all dependent on each other. Um, how can we map the how can we map the um, dependencies and how can we how can we see where Sheffield is most vulnerable? So we did 80, 80 plus stakeholders from across the city, um, including government representatives, and we had a yeah several weeks on, on workshops. Uh, training courses in, in seeing okay where where are our hotspots where are we, we vulnerable what's built in the floodplain um, how do we get from here to there um, where is the police headquarter one of the biggest one was flooded um, where where are the hospitals where is the food supply coming in etc etc so this this was a big exercise we did and it, it wasn't rocket science it was all probably a couple of people could have sat down in an office and come up with the same thing, but because it was done as a stakeholder event, it was it was it was as much about facts and the vulnerabilities as communication and, and getting across to people. This is reality. We are we are vulnerable, and it's up to your responsibility and not just the local government because we can't do anything ourselves anymore. So this this was the sort of the, the outcome. Um, what we need to develop, and colleagues are now looking into. We are, re we are rewriting our transport strategy currently. Um, we are looking at uh, a low carbon energy strategy. Housing already working. We already developed the water and flood management strategy. So this is all now feeding into new policies and strategy and making the connection. So if Water flooding, flooding is the is the lead system. What are the other dependencies here? 
So this was one of the more big projects just to gather information and, and do communication and awareness raising and hopefully lead to behavior change. So this is now very different. Um, I just looked into um, other areas of climate change. Um, and, and if you look if you look in the Nile, Nile Delta, you can, you, can, you can see that the projection is there will be more rain in certain areas um, and much less in others and how that affects the quality. And this is um, And we start to remind that of what we can face. Because a lot of people in England, there's still a lot of ignorance when they say, I oh, have yeah, two, two degrees Celsius. They just say, bring it on. Like summer in England, finally. But they don't, a lot of the public doesn't, they don't understand what that means. If it's two degrees globally, that could mean devastation in other areas and not much in, not much in the UK. So, um, I think the biggest challenge for us officers in a local authority is convincing the public and, and, and awareness raising and behaviour change. And I'm sure you've seen this before. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Because in the one example you said it's low emission now, so did you change like the buses itself or did you also change like the ways they are going? Um, we are working as a government government funding scheme at the moment to introduce low carbon vehicle technology. So we are, we are the first city in the UK um, installing and that maybe tells you how, how late the UK comes to the party. We are we are installing compressed natural gas filling stations and rapid recharging stations for electric vehicles, including buses. Um, so we are working with the bus operators to change the technology of the vehicles, which is difficult because public transport has been outsourced. There are only a few. There are only a few cities, like London, Transport for London, where the, where the mayor has actually the powers to control what happens with transport. We have about five different bus companies, and they don't answer to anybody but their shareholders. So we have a real job to convince two different maintenance people who purchase their vehicles on a five-year cycle. So we've got money now to give to you to purchase clean vehicles. And they said, but I've bought my buses last year. I have to run them for another four years. I can't use your money right now. So it's really difficult if it's with the, with the decentralization and privatization in England um, to, get, to get things in a coherent way. So what we are working with them, we are progressing and um, we have in, I don't know how many now, but I think it's about 10, 10 to 15 buses have been retrofitted now, which is a drop in the ocean, but it's more, sometimes more about demonstrating the technology and convincing others how it's working, which then has a trickle effect when the next cycle of procurement comes, so they maybe buy gas vehicles, gas buses or electric hybrid buses. So, um, with regards to routing, there's an organization called Sheffield Community Transport, which is a third sector charity who does, um, who organize transport to reach vulnerable and disabled people. And they, they have now a computer system which allows them to reroute whether there's an accident or a flood. So they know how they can reroute to get to different to different points in in order to be more flexible and more resilient. And that has been introduced because of the flooding. Um, 
I was wondering how does the Fintown Foundation work with the transportation system because you also mentioned that they are um, doing something with the transportation but as I understood it's still a village and may, so how do they... Yeah, it's, it's really, it's rural, rural transport and um, the Fintown Foundation has two different locations there is the big community where I showed you on the, on the on the map, and then there's also in the nearest town there is a college, which is part of the foundation, and they have their own commuting buses backwards and forth. So they run their own. They have, I think they got a couple of recycling vans as well, picking up the waste material. They got vehicles if for the you know for the gar for the gardening and for the agriculture. Um, but mainly they use the, the local, the local public transport. But they have their own mini fleet. How is it with personal money? Of course, there are some other systems or other equivalents. If you get a member, then you have to grant everything to the community. So how is the structure in there? Are you also allowed to work somewhere else, or are you only allowed to work for and with the community? Now this, this is why it's, it's quite complex. There are people that live in the community and work outside. There are people that um, work in the community but live outside. So all the combinations are possible. Um, if, you, if you become a member, you don't have to give up your money. If you have money, you keep your money. But there's probably less a chance for you to get more, to earn more money. So a lot of people do struggle with that. They, well, there's a disadvantage if you're lucky enough and sell your house in London and then move up to Scotland to become a member, you can live on that money for a long time. And uh, your, your sort of pocket money you get, you do get, you do get cash and money from the community as well as your accommodation and food and everything you need. But it's not, you know, if you want to do uh, want to go on a three-week holiday to Mexico, you know, it might be not a lot of, you need more money. Um, so it's, it's a personal choice. You sign up to that community living and, and sort of accept that you live of basic, on a basic means. Um, but no, no, if you've got money, if you inherited money, that's yours. The foundation doesn't want any of your personal money. It's just the foundation will not pay you a huge salary. You get everything you need and you get some money, but um, the foundation can't pay you a competitive salary for your job. That's, that's your own decision if you want to. But the combinations are numerous. I was, I was again, I was in a different category. I was paid for my job, but I had to pay accommodation and food. So it's quite... You know, because I wanted, I, I needed, I needed my employment on my CV. So I wanted a national insurance number. So I have something to show on my CV that I've worked, rather than volunteered, if you know what I mean. So for me, I had to find a system that worked for me, to help me in my, in my career. So it's all, it's all possible. <clears throat> I have a question on, on the way you shifted in the, your work in, from the rural to the small community phase. And the question of, of actually uh, sustainability. Where, I, where in the, in the, uh, the end, you, you, where you focus on this climate change and you start kind of mapping the vulnerability on, on, on the my question then, can I argue the fact that if we wanted to reach an ecological sustainable system whatsoever it is, that the urban fails to kind of reach the sustainable uh, situation because we start to deal with this multi-interdependent -inter system that basically we are unable to manage and it, we're not only speaking about the interiority of it but also the ecology of the city in general when you're speaking about the food system, I mean, 
if we are asking like from where does this urban area or city uh, has its food and most probably it becomes like an, a global network of, 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 of problematics and the more we go we have the tendency to shift to the urban the more complicated the networks become so this and uh, taking it into consideration specifically in your practice which is about the environmental change and actually you mentioned several times that the urban is vulnerable towards, towards uh, environmental change. And this is also happening in the Middle East. Like, suddenly we are going into the heat waves which are actually now going on. In the, in the, in the, and basically we're not ready for it. So it's a kind of a moment of the failure of infrastructure. And that you are running with, uh, running two kind of um, uh, make this infrastructure that is built since years to work in this. this. I, I, what I'm trying to argue then, why, why, why not we think of a rural model than, than, than an urban one? Because also what is produced in a rural, uh, in, 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 a, in a more a bigger community, in a bigger population, where we start to speak about inequality, uh, marginalization, uh, politics of the government, uh, activism starts to emerge. There's different things. Like in the, the small community of 300, or let's say, 1,000 people, uh, things can be done on a more like uh, material level. I'm just kind of yeah, yeah, arguing. Yeah, I, I think I think there are conflicts. I mean, if you if you look at the population growth globally, I don't think we can sustain rural life. As such. I think we need the highly densely populated areas and make them as sustainable as possible. And try to source, you know, be very efficient what we grow and how we grow it. And that goes from less meat, you know, because we can feed so many more people if it's a vegetarian based diet. You know, have to meat once or twice a week rather than seven days a week. You, you can sustain people much, on a much larger scale. But if, if everybody, for example, in Sheffield wants to move to the nice green western part of Sheffield, it won't be nice green for much longer. Mm -hmm. So protecting the national park, which is a green belt and, and uh, a respite and, and, and just beautiful for people to experience in their, their time, but make, make the, the city living as sustainable and as efficient as possible and create Structure that is resilient and efficient. So look, look at you know, passive ventilation, natural daylight. So reduce your carbon footprint as much as possible. And if you can, I mean, a lot of a lot of um, restaurants in Sheffield are now trying to be regional. They try to source their ingredients regionally and seasonally. So if we if we accept, you know, we can't have asparagus twelve years uh, twelve months in a year and um, and asparagus and certain things grow in a radius of about twenty to thirty miles of Sheffield. So just be aware, get your stuff and as regional and as seasonal as you can. But of course a city of half a million or bigger bigger cities are global. Your, your supply is global, and no matter how you do it. But I think your footprint, you can still work on your footprint and make that more, reduce your footprint, make it more responsible, more resilient. And then I think you can manage with rural development and rural communities as well, who may be part of that supply chain. But if everybody wants to move out, I don't think it will, I don't think it will work. Because the distances you have then, you know, if you have to, to, to introduce the transport system, the energy system on those long, long distances to get reach everybody, if you have that condensed in a holistic, you know, sustainable concentration with good quality of life, fairness in it as well, I think people are happy to live close together in cities. And it comes to
question regarding the eco village example, how you mentioned that some of the members are associates and are like part time members, not full time. So, what would be the benefit of them joining? They're not geographically directly inside the area, right? They're a bit on the outskirts. So, how would they be participating? What's their incentive to participate? And is there like some uh, idea of having a more global network, or is it just in the area? Or reaching out to people who want to do similar things, or training them, or giving advice like consultants, because you said also yeah. that they're, yeah, they're, they're now like conflict management consultants, but are they also like sustainability consultants? The, inter the interest is a lot of people read about the foundation, visited for conference or workshop or seminar like I did, and you're either, you're either intrigued by it or you're not. I was, I was interested, so I kept going back for another workshop, and, and, um, and then it's up to you if you really feel it's the right time, the right place to be for that period of time, you make it happen. If you're really committed to become a member, if you want your independency, semi-independency, but you want to be affiliated, associated with the organization, or you just like the whole <coughs> energy environment it creates, because there's a lot of cultural stuff going on. So you can live outside in a small town or village, but volunteer. Stay connected with the events, like stay connected with the culture of events, for example. Again? Stay connected with the cultural events. That's how you would be participating, or would you, you can, actually have responsibilities? You can work there. You can you can volunteer. You can work if you if you want to be in the gardening team. A lot of people come from the outside just because they want to work in the gardens, and they 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 get um, a different arrangements. You either volunteer completely. Or you get you get your meal supplied for the day. You some some job because they run big conferences, not international conferences. There 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 will be work. You know they need people doing the cameras and the IT and uh, they've got a recording studio. You know Scottish bands go there to record. So that is paid work if you want to. Once you're there and you've got a skill and you you know you can be the cameraman and be paid for it, for an event, or, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's there, are, there are 101 ways of being there, if you want to. And in terms of the global network, let's say I'm someone from the Middle East who's interested in collaborating, or at least learning, would there be a possibility for someone to do such a thing, or is it more on the scale of Great Britain? No, 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 but, I mean, it's a, it's a Scottish community, but they are part of a network and they have exchanged with a, a big community in Brazil, which is very different, um, maybe based in the, in, in the jungle. So there's a very small but eco community in Brazil they support. So they have sent people there to help them setting up the structure, um, the governance, they have exchanged, they, they, they pay some of the younger students to come and live in Scotland for a while. So there's a huge exchange going on and the global the gen, the global eco village network is is if you go on there I'm pretty sure you will find different ways of either experiencing a community or you know start something, become a member and benefit from the network. So this yeah this is This one, the Fintan Foundation is vegetarian, for example, yeah? but they, they also have an island on the west coast where they have their own farm and it's not vegetarian, so they have their own livestock, and a lot of and they they produce a lot of a lot of bees wax candles, which are then being used in the community. So there's a whole, you know, this is just it's it's. You make you you make it you make it as you but no there's this definitely 
the Finna Foundation is very open-minded and very um, open for exchange um, with other with other organizations and communities across across the world. I mean, being being part of the UN of the UN network is just one of the one of the results of being so active globally. Um, <laughs> okay. So I think um, I will thank you for coming. And, uh, thank you for coming. It was a very interesting input. I hope it was um, relevant to you. Yeah. Yes. If you're interested to exchange, I think that's possible now, even after the lecture. We will also upload your presentation and uh, make the video accessible if, uh, if we are technically... <laughs> I, got, I got one printout um, about the foundation of the eco-village, if anybody wants to take this and photocopy it again. It's, it's, um, it's the sort of... Um, the story about the carbon carbon neutral community and um, very low carbon footprint for a Western a Western community. So you can I can leave that here. And I'll leave that. Okay. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for um, managing with the heat today.